Don't miss the State of the Race podcast series available free for you uh, anywhere you get your podcast. Under the Stew Does America stream, just subscribe. You get this show, you get that show. It's, so, it's I mean, it works so well together. Uh, by the way, don't forget to follow the show on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash America. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the videos, including our latest investigation on Corinne Jean-Pierre. It is up there right now. I think you'll enjoy it. Mike Rowe is here with his latest initiative to get people working and learning instead of wasting time in college. The special counsel for Joe Biden's classified documents case sheds some more light on his investigation. But we start by doing the hit on Elon Musk. And you know my opinion on Elon Musk, right? You know it. If you, if you said yes to that, will you tell me what it is? Because I, I honestly, I'm very conflicted on the guy. I mean, now uh, he does some things I really like. He does some things I don't like so much. I mean, his environment stuff drives me crazy. His Bitcoin stance drives me crazy. Uh, but then he sort of likes the Bitcoin stuff, and then he sort of is okay on the environment in some ways because even though he's kind of nuts on it, he's not necessarily looking for the government to do all the things about it, and he t- sort of embraces fossil fuels when necessary, but then sometimes makes them sound like they're the worst thing in the world. And and then you know his, 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 his he does a great job on Twitter with free speech, and then but he also does that thing where I can't tell anyone who's real on on Twitter anymore, and then it's not even called Twitter anymore. I, I there's so many different things. Uh, with uh, with Elon Musk. And of course, every day brings you multiple new pieces to the puzzle because he's in the news for basically anything. Outside of like Donald Trump and Taylor Swift, he's the guy that can get himself in the news more than anyone else. Um, speaking of Donald Trump, Trump apparently, reportedly, asked Elon Musk if he wanted to buy Truth Social. Uh, no, no word on that uh, as of yet, of course, officially. Uh, he's, of course, also suing OpenAI. OpenAI denies Elon Musk a lawsuit claim that there ever was a founding agreement, which I feel like I've heard them talk openly about in interviews for years and years and years and years, but apparently maybe nothing official. And then, of course, Elon Musk talking about illegal immigration. He says Democrats allow illegal immigration to build political power, and that one kind of passes the sniff test. So, again, you can find, you can say whatever you want to say about Elon Musk. And You know, I I don't begrudge anyone an an opinion on this. I mean, one of the reasons why I went back and read a couple of different books on Musk was to kind of understand him better. And and at the end of it, you you kind of still wind up with a lot of questions, honestly. He is a brilliant businessman in a lot of ways, gets things done in kind of that old school way where you just, you know, nose to the grindstone. We're just going to keep working and trying things. He certainly believes strongly in capitalism, which is something I really appreciate. Now, he's not always so nice to his employees. It doesn't seem like the greatest guy in the world to work for, frankly. Uh, Also, uh, you know, I mean, he's getting sued currently by former Twitter executives. And if you read the story in in the book that, by the way, he participated in. So, I mean, it's some I don't want to say it's an official account from his style uh, story by any means. But, you know, he he allowed the author to follow follow him around for months, seemingly uh, uh, heavily participated in the book. Lots of interviews, et cetera. The story about the Twitter executives and how they lost all the money they were owed is, uh, I, I mean, you never think you're going to side with former Twitter executives, but I got to say that one was not handled very well. My point is, it's a, it's a very complicated story. And of course, the New York Times needs to get involved in this as well. And it's funny because of all the things that you should be able to agree with on Elon Musk is, you know, he's got a lot of money. And he's giving a lot of that money away. And we should probably all agree that that's a good thing, right? Doesn't that seem basic? Isn't that kind of the most basic part of this? When you find someone who's very, very wealthy, who's giving away a bunch of his money for charitable reasons, like, hey, that's great. You might say you don't like the way he gives it away exactly, but generally speaking, we can kind of all agree that it's a good thing when people show selflessness. And, and, and you know, again, you know, maybe if you're reading in a, you know, The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand, you're maybe a little bit uh, conflicted on that particular one. But most people agree with that general take. Apparently, though, not if you're the wrong kind of rich person. Because if you're George Soros and you're giving all your money to the Democratic Party, well, that's totally fine, obviously. But if you're the wrong kind of billionaire and you're giving away your money the wrong way to charitable causes, well, then you're a bad person. Elon Musk has a giant charity. Its money stays close to home. Oh, no. After making billions in tax-deductible donations to his philanthropy, the owner of Tesla and SpaceX gave away far less than required in some years. And what he did give often supported his own interests. 
this is a fascinating article, and it's part of the sort of long-term weird relationship the media has had with Elon Musk, where they praised him as the best guy in history when he was talking about global warming all the time and building a giant, the biggest uh, electric car company, and really changing the world when it comes to uh, electric cars. He's really been the only one who's been able to pull it off. I mean, there's one Chinese company, but I don't know if you can count that considering this Chinese structure. Uh, the Tesla is really the only one who's been able to do this. He kind of did it from almost scratch. He was not the first person in the company, but very, very early investor and decided to come along for it, took, got control and built it into a behemoth. It's true. I mean, you can see Tesla's all over the road now, and that was not the case uh, a few years ago when it comes to electric cars. Tesla almost failed a bunch of times. SpaceX almost failed a bunch of times. He was able to keep that going. But the media loved him when he was doing those things when it related to global warming. When he started doing other things, that's when they decided to get critical of him. Let me uh, give you, now of course you know they love a Bill Gates, for example. Bill Gates does the things they want him to do, right? He's talking, he's donating to giant UN initiatives. He's donating for, you know, all these different things, you know, causes that the left love. So he gets praise, even though you know, back in the day when he was just a capitalist and he was getting sued for antitrust uh, issues, they were totally against him. It's all about what you believe. It's all about do you believe the right things or not? And then you get the good treatment or the bad treatment. Well, Elon was believing the right things for a long time. And then he opened up his, his uh, factory during COVID. And then he bought Twitter and he let people have free speech. And then he kind of said, oh, well, you know, maybe I don't believe in everything the government is doing. Now, it was fine when he was taking building Tesla on the backs of lots of taxpayer benefits uh, for purchasing the cars. Probably the company doesn't exist without that uh, because it almost failed even with giant government giveaways. But now he's kind of been more uh, anti-government giveaways and now he's a bad guy. Anyway, here we go. Unlike Bill Gates, who has deployed his fortune in an effort to improve healthcare across Africa, or Walmart's Walton family, which has spurred change in the American education system, Mr. Musk's philanthropy has been haphazard and largely self-serving, making him eligible for enormous tax breaks and helping his businesses because no one who gives charitable donations possibly would take a tax break for it. That's a crazy concept. Of course, that's exactly what everybody does and, of course, what everyone should do. You should get a tax break when you're giving your money away for nothing. When you're giving your money away for no benefit to yourself all you're trying to do is help other people. Yeah, they shouldn't tax you on that money. I know it's a crazy idea, uh, but there you go. Mr. Musk's giving often seemed guided by Twitter, where he had made splashy promises in response to challenges from Internet celebrities. He gave $1 million to plant trees after a prompting from the YouTuber Mr. Beast and $1 million to help small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic after a push from Dave Portnoy, the founder of Bar Barstool Sports. So... So what? I mean, the guy lives on Twitter. He actually is literally the owner of Twitter. So the fact that he is inspired by Twitter is not exactly crazy when it comes to how he gives his money away. Is that surprising to you? Is that surprising to anybody? So what? You know, some people have conversations where they're won over and they get glowing stories about the New York Times. I had this awakening from this person I met and they told me about this sad sob story and I felt so bad that I decided to change. So what? He saw a tweet and decided to give a million dollars. Is that bad? He helped out a bunch of small business owners during COVID-19 when the government was shutting them all down. Is that bad? Well, it was bad because it was against the narrative of what COVID-19, COVID the government was supposed to be there for you on that. Not Dave Portnoy, not Elon Musk. No, no. The government was supposed to step in and save the economy, and now they're not getting credit for it. They're, you're almost acting like they're not doing enough. Um, Mr. Musk, they throw this in at the end. Mr. Musk is under no obligation to have a charity, and he's made clear that he believes his for-profit enterprises will change the world far better and far more than any philanthropic adventure could. Of course, that's undeniably true. I like charity. Charity's great. Glenn's got a big charity. We all know it's done a lot of good things. But you know what? Frankly, there's no way you can touch what capitalism does for people. Uh, it's the best charity. Even freaking Bono knows that. Bono has even talked about that. He has. He's involved in a lot of charities. But he's, he says the best way to affect charity, to change the world, is capitalism. Uh, this is true of, of every single big company. They do more for the world than any charitable enterprise 
can with the same amount of money, an equal amount of money. Why? Well, I mean, it's different, right? Like, I mean, talk to people who, I have a friend who uh, works a lot with uh, charities in Haiti. And, you know, he talks about how difficult it is. Haiti's having its own crazy week this week. But he talks about how difficult it is because, you know, people in Haiti, like, they have, they want to be able to do these things themselves. Coming in and airlifting a bunch of cash onto their shores and saying, hey, buy yourself out of your poverty is not a sustainable model. The money comes. A lot of times it's, ta- you know, it's caught up in corruption. And, of course, even if it gets to the people, it's a one-time thing. You know, it's teaching a person to fish, not just handing the fish. And it, a lot of people, I mean, this is something that they wind up doing in Haiti, I know, in particular, but it's happened across the world, where the, these these charities are now saying, you know what, actually, we don't want you to just give us a bunch of money. What we want you to do is come in and maybe you can train people to, to, to work in a new field, maybe uh, help people survive down the road so they can do it themselves and have pride in their own work and their pride in their own ownership. They were not just handed these things. That's not how people grow. Getting a bunch of gift handouts is, is, is great maybe to start the wheel going a little bit, but it's never going to be something that's going to lead to a long-term sustainable change. Well, it goes into where else he gave his money, and uh, I, th- I find it to be fascinating. These are the complaints against Elon Musk. In 2022, the last year for which records are available, they gave away $160 million. Now, how do you bash someone who gave away $160 million? Well, apparently it was not high enough to hit some minimum government standard of $234 million. So that's, that's bad. But it goes on. Among the donations the Musk Foundation has made, There was $55 million to help a major SpaceX customer meet a charitable pledge. Well, that just sounds terrible. So he basically gave the money, but he didn't direct it. He gave it to another charity that gave it away, and that's supposed to be make it less. Uh, It's supposed to make him lesser. And this one, there were millions that went to Cameron County, Texas, uh, after a rocket blew up. Okay, so a rocket blew up. He's trying to make good. He gave away a bunch of money there. Donations to two schools closely tied to his businesses. One walled off inside a SpaceX compound, the other located next to a new subdivision for Musk's employees. So the richest man in the world gave a bunch of money away to help his employees and their children learn. That's the complaint. I want to make sure I understand this, because usually what we get from The New York Times is that big billionaire business owners don't care about their employees. But now the complaint is he's giving away too much money to benefit his employees? That's the new complaint? How do we even keep track of this crap? This is completely ridiculous in every way. Let me give you another one. This is the, uh, the charitable foundation, by the way, uh, that he was trying to, the charitable pledge he was trying to, uh, to help. Uh, The Musk Foundation, for instance, gave $5 million to United Nations program that helps countries identify rural schools that need Internet access. And then they use that money to uh, partially get Starlink. So basically gave away free Internet. But no, they say it. they, They describe it this way. Some of these countries then became Mr. Musk's customers. Well, with his own money. He gave away millions of dollars and some of that came back to Starlink and we're going to act like that's not a giveaway. So what if that's what he did? He's helping people who need Internet access get Internet. So why is this bad? One of the biggest gifts he gave was uh, helped one of SpaceX's customers, Jared Isaacman, a Pennsylvania billionaire who chartered a trip on SpaceX in 2021. Isaacman said the flight would raise $200 million for St. Jude's Children's Research um, by raffling off one of the four seats on the flight. When Mr. Isaacson touched down on Earth, the mission's Twitter account said it was still short of the $200 million goal. Count me in for $50 million, said Musk. Musk eventually paid $55 million to the foundation. Again, this is portrayed in the New York Times as if he's helping some customer of his The money went to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. And he's getting bashed for this? 
The, the amount, and, and New York Times is a very capitalist corporation, by the way. You know, they always complain about how bad things are in the media. Well, part of the reason why is the, they're the only ones who are successful with their subscriptions, and they're putting all the small places out of business. They seem pretty damn capitalistic when it comes down to it. Uh, yet they seem to also despise capitalism, or at least anyone else utilizing it, even when that money... Did the New York Times get $55 million to St. Jude's Research Hospital at any time recently? I, maybe they did. I didn't hear about it. Maybe they should cover that in the New York Times, and then they can bash themselves for doing it. By the way, more examples. Uh, he, I am donating $20 million to Cameron County Schools, $10 million to the city of Brownsville for downtown revitalizations. Details to follow next week. Or this one. Hey, Elon Musk, I heard a bunch of people saying there's no way you could, give, you could help clean water to Flint, Michigan. Said you wouldn't be capable. Uh, Musk responds on Twitter. Please consider this a commitment that I will fund fixing the water in any house in Flint that has water contamination above FDA levels. Not kidding. This is similar to the criticism received by Mr. Beast, who uh, I recently mentioned. Mr. Beast built a hundred wells in Africa, attracting praise and some criticism. Why? Because he funded it with a YouTube video. A hundred wells in Africa, thousands of people given surgery for uh, the lack of eyesight, simple surgeries that can be uh, cured uh, really easily. And, 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 and Mr. Beast has stepped in to help that. These are the good things that capitalism is doing. Only some of the good things. As we've mentioned, we could write stories about billions of people reached, uh, ripped out of poverty by global capitalism. These things rarely get covered because they are so common. They happen every day. Thousands of people every single day that would have died instead live because of capitalism. And this is the way our media treats it. And this is the why, one of the big reasons why capitalism keeps getting a bad name, why people who are young don't seem to like it all that much despite enjoying all of the benefits of it. It is a disgrace. And it's putting, I mean this sincerely, billions of lives at risk. Because if capitalism goes away, you will see the, the, the lifespan of people get shorter around, around the globe. You will see more people who are caught up in diseases that could have been cured if, if global capitalism was able to run as free as it possibly can. You would see people go hungry, people starving. All of these things are real consequences of destroying capitalism, yet our media seems to want to do it after benefiting from the many fruits it has produced over the years. It is disgraceful, and we do not talk about it enough. This is one of the great miracles of all of our lifetimes. Capitalism and the rise and the things that it has achieved, and yet we have an administration and a media that is solely lined up with the apparent intent to destroy it completely. It's a disgrace, and it should end now. America. Ever feel like something is up? You know, something big, something suspicious. You can't quite pinpoint it. You can't really deny it either. All you have to do is trust your gut. You can listen to it and prepare with my Patriot Supply. And if you're not into trusting your gut so much, you just want to trust your mind. Well, you know, things can go wrong. I don't know if you were around the last couple of years. The whole 2020 thing, I think, shook us out of whatever uh, nice little warm, cozy hibernation we were in. Since 2008, my Patriot Supply has helped millions of American families prepare for an uncertain future. Many of them choose the three-month emergency food kits. With 22 food and drink varieties, there will be no food boredom. Over 2,000 calories a day, there will be no starvation, which is kind of important, I've heard. You know, you shouldn't really starve yourself. Uh, uh, sealed inside uh, ultra durable four layer packaging. These ready hour meals are up to, uh, you know, last for like 25 years in storage. So you don't have to keep doing this all the time. This is kind of a one time thing. You go in there, get it taken care of. You can rotate through it if you want, but you got a long time to have to think about this again. You can stock up, stock up on all the food kits your family needs at the website preparewithstew.com. Get 200 bucks off your kit. Uh, that's great. Uh, 200 bucks off. Uh, that's, that's pretty big. Plus, you can protect yourself. You can protect your people with preparewithstew.com. They'll ship fast and free. Check it out now. My Patriot Supply, they love you. They want to prepare you. Preparewithstew.com. I'm excited to, uh, to welcome Mike Rowe to the program. Uh, of course, you know him. Uh, he's executive producer 
host of Dirty Jobs. He's also CEO of the Mike Rowe Works Foundation and host of The Way I Heard It with Mike Rowe. Great podcast you should definitely subscribe to wherever you get your podcast. Mike, great to see you. Technically, I wasn't the host of Dirty Jobs. I mean, that's what it says in the credits. Yeah. But really, I was a guest. I guess that's kind of true. Wow. And honestly, when I, when I figured that out, that's when the whole world changed. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, words matter, labels matter. And if you, if you think of yourself as a host, you start to do hosty things. You yeah. know, you yeah. start looking for the camera and whatnot. I try to do that all the time. It's almost impossible not to. Mm-hmm. See, look, it says executive, producer, and host. Wrong. Wrong. It's a guest. Liars. It's a guest. Liars. More lies on the blaze. <laughs> this is what happens over here. This is how it <laughs> Actually, quick, before we get into the other stuff, you were very close multiple times to being the host of The Daily Show, mm-hmm. right? Twice. Twice. <laughs> Twice, man. Can, uh, well, can you give us a, a quick rundown? Oh, it's sure. A, it's a spectacular story. Well, back in the day, um, I, I was impersonating a host for a living, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I had a lot of different jobs, and I worked for a lot of different networks, and I heard that this Comedy Central place, which sounded like a really fun place to work, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I like what comedy. What a blast, yeah. They got this new show, and they were having a national talent search, and I auditioned, and I got called back, and... I got through the callback, and they called me back again, and they asked me to go on the set, write a monologue, and, and do some stuff, and I did. Okay. And they called me and said, look, uh, this is great. You, <laughs> we, we love you. Um, job's Huge. yours. Yeah. Wow. So this is on a Friday. They say, come in Monday, meet the writers, and we'll start figuring this out. So I'm like, okay. Now remember, this is 1998 or something. N- nobody knows what this is, right. in, including me. Uh, I go in Monday, and I go into this room, and they're, they're like, no writers. There's just one <laughs> woman sitting there named <laughs> Madeline Smithberg, and she's like, yeah, so over the weekend, <laughs> ESPN let Craig Kilborn out of his deal, mm-hmm. and our boss, Doug Herzog, really wanted him. So, so we'd like to offer you the role of a, uh, of a, of a consultant. Mm. And I, my feelings were kind of hurt. <laughs> yeah, I would <laughs> I think like, so. I don't want to be a consultant. And as luck would have it, at, around the same time, Dick Clark uh, asked me if I wanted to host a game show. 40 episodes, mm-hmm. guaranteed. Yeah. So I went to L.A. and hosted a game show. Mm. And that was okay. And then a year later, <laughs> Craig Kilborn got the big call from CBS to host their late night show. Yeah. So he leaves, <laughs> and now Madeline Smithberg's like, oh, God, this is awful. So they call me back. Lines up perfectly for you. <laughs> and they're like, listen, <laughs> we all love you, mm-hmm. and we'd like to offer this opportunity back to you. We can't do it officially, but I, I can tell you off the record, the only way this isn't going to work, <laughs> is, her words, is if this cheap-ass network comes up with a big pile of money for, like, Norm MacDonald or Dennis Miller or John Stewart, but but that's never gonna happen. <laughs> I think I know how that one turned out. Yeah. A week later they found a big old bag of money and that's and so mm. but you know what? I'm not gonna say everything happens for a reason because I don't I don't believe that. Mm-hmm. But everything does happen and way leads on the way and by the time John Stewart was crushing it on the Daily Show, I was crawling through a sewer and dirty jobs became a thing. So much of it is not necessarily it all happens for a reason, but it all does happen with you, giving you an opportunity to figure out how to react to it. I think so. Well, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, it, metaphors are powerful. And if life is a game or a dance, right, mm-hmm. then reacting is as much, uh, as much a job as, as acting. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to react. You have yeah. to play the cards you get. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was, it was just another one of those examples where, hey, Mike, universe here, you're not in charge. Mm. This is, yeah, we get that you want it. Can't have it. Uh-oh. Um, it's interesting you bring this up because I think there is a, a change in society in general that I'm sure you've noticed, which seems to now see, instead of a reaction to some, a situation like this where you maybe get a raw deal and trying to make the best out of it and turning that into a lesson and turning it into something else, it's now the victimization, mm. right? <laughs> like, it's just right. this, like... now. And it's not only that people claim victimization all the time, it's like the pinnacle of our society. If you can paint yourself into a victim, that's now a 
positive. And I feel like the country was built by people who looked at the world the exact opposite way. I suspect you're right. You know, I, I look, it's tempting and anything that's tempting deserves a, a second look. But it's 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 tempting to blame somebody else. Yeah. It's it's tempting to talk about the injustice of it all. And that's not to suggest that there's not injustice out there. Of course there is. You know, you're not going to get your way most of the time. And things are going to conspire against you. And people are going to conspire against you. All sorts of bad things are going to happen. Yeah, I get it. You know, the question is what, so what? Just, <laughs> just, just so yeah. what? You know, I mean, yeah. I, dirty jobs in so many ways um, reconnected me to some things that I had kind of lost sight of in my life. Things I had become disconnected from. Some, some, like some very literal things, like, like where my food came from and, and, yeah. and where my energy comes from. All that primal stuff. Uh, but also things like job satisfaction and the dignity of work and the fact that you know, everybody's playing the cards they get as, as best they can. And the Dirty Jobbers as a group, and I, I didn't do the show as a polemic, and I, and, I, and I certainly didn't do it as some sort of social experiment, but by season three and four, you know, we had hundreds of them under our belt, and you could start to look at this group of people as a group, and you could start to ask yourself questions like, well, what do they know that I don't? And how come they're having so much fun covered in other people's crap? Yeah. And, you know, why... Why is my idea of success being turned inside out the more I work on this show and the more I labor with these, with these people? Hmm. Uh, and the answer, I think, truly does have something to do with, as a group, you just didn't find a lot of self-pity these, with these people. What, what you found was an awareness, uh, kind of like, like on Band of Brothers, you know, there's this sense that we're engaged in work that is often out of sight and often out of mind and seen by many as non-glamorous mm -hmm. and, and derided in many cases by society. But rather than accept all of those stigmas and stereotypes as victims, there was more of a like, yeah, we get it, that's them, but we know what happens. We sewage workers, we garbage men, mm. we welders, we steam fitters, pipe fitters. We, we know what will happen if we all call in sick for a week. And the fact that they don't is a, is a real treasure. Yeah. Um, it, there's a famous essay, I Pencil, uh, sure. which goes through. Walter. And, yeah, you're going to test me on the name. I, I, Oh, God, it's so close. It's still my time. But, but I, I know it. It's a, it's a yeah, great rumination. It is. On, and yeah. it, it talks about how a pencil basically gets to you, all the things, that, all the miracles that have to occur. You know, sometimes I walk into these, these giant stores that kind of carry a little bit of everything, with groceries and, and everything. And a lot of people walk in there and they say, like, oh, fluorescent lights. And I look at it as a miracle. How on earth do we live in a place where all of these products could be available to people at low prices, anything you want. You walk into the store, almost anyone in our society can afford them. Yeah. That's never been the case anywhere in human history. I mean, this, these are miracles that we see every day. We never realize it. I know. I know. I, I feel exactly the same way. Sometimes I talk about it in terms of our infatuation with innovation mm. versus imitation. This was another big dirty jobs lesson because I met a lot of people on that show who, who were involved in the business of mass production. And so often we tend to think of that as a kind of drudgery, just to kind of making little rocks out of big rocks. Yeah. But if you look at it like, like this, right, this, th this thing is a marvel of innovation. Mm -hmm. Big brains took a long time to get the iPhone 15 to be this miracle that it is. But the real miracle is putting this thing in the hands of billions of people, right? Yeah. It just as miraculous as the tech and the innovation that allowed this thing to occur is the, the ability to duplicate it with no variance billions of times over. Yeah. That's huge. So I think in a lot of ways what we do as a society is tend to, we, we put our thumb on the scale and assess a certain value to the innovative properties 
um, that's where the glamour and the sex appeal is, you know, and it comes at the expense of the brute routines required to make it something other than a prototype. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if you... Ideas are easy. Scale is hard. Always. Mm -hmm. Always. But to your point, it's easy to walk in Walmart and go, oh my God, what, what's how Western civilization, is this what we've come to? Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. Thank God. Pretty great. Yeah, pretty and, great. And by the way, good mm -hmm. for them for eliminating the college uh, requirement box mm -hmm. now. They've joined a couple dozen other companies who are, who are doing that, no longer requiring uh, a college degree. They got a $400,000 position right now, ru running a super center, 400 grand, no degree required. Wow. I think that's pretty great. Yeah, the credentialism has been a real problem, and it makes no sense either. None. Um, I started the show talking about uh, Elon Musk, uh, Mr. Beast, mm -hmm. how these guys are getting criticism for giving away millions and Isn't millions amazing? of dollars. Amazing. I, I find it fascinating. There's a huge New York Times piece about how Elon Musk is he's only giving away money to uh, charities that benefit his own employees. Like, this is a knock. You selfish. What a bastard. But it's even, I mean, the whole Jimmy Donaldson story, mm. that Mr. Beast thing. Yeah. The, wait a minute. He went to Africa and he dug wells. <laughs> yeah. He dug wells for jerk. thirsty kids. What a jerk. What a, what a glad handing, you know. I mean, they had quotes from people in NGOs involved in the same attempt yeah. to help these villages going, you know, it is kind of frustrating to see this gajillionaire come over here and just get it get it done. And we're like, what? You, you know what else is frustrating? Mm. <clears throat> uh, starving to death. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not having water. Being really. thirsty. Yeah. It sucks, you it's, know. Yeah, you'd think that, I, and I, I think, you know, and you've done a lot of work in this front. Um, and I, by the way, I know we have another segment recorded. Can we just, can we slide that to tomorrow? Because I, I, I have to ask get you about this. Get the heck with this segment. Yes, yeah, screw the other I'm segment. staying. Yeah, he's staying. staying. Mike is staying. Um, <laughs> you've done a lot with this because... You've, you know, raised money for people to actually learn these trades, for these things to actually happen, right? And and the college thing got such a. You know, I didn't go to college, uh, I, I, and I think like it's great for some people. It's not for everybody. You don't need you certainly don't need it for this stupid show. <laughs> you, you, you college is is great for some things, but like having people who actually can do work that benefits people as opposed to giving us new CRT lessons, you know, I think there's a lot of value there. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the work that you're doing here? Well, I, I can talk a lot about that. Yeah. I, I, I think that um, you said it exactly right. It, it, there's nothing inherently good or bad about college. It's, it's, mm. it's, a, it's a thing that you can experience. And in terms of a diploma, it's a, it's a thing that you can buy. Is it a thing you can afford? I don't know. Studies show probably not. Yeah. And we can Slide have and a, go. Yeah. Well, we can have lots of conversations about all that. But the, the thing I believe is indisputable is the stupidity of claiming that one size fits all. Mm. College for all, that was crazy. And we fell in love with it. The same reason that we fell in love with the innovation of this, mm -hmm. right, is the reason we fell in love with the idea of college for everyone. And look, I mean, just that expression, if everybody does go to college, well, if I understand the math right, then nobody goes to trade school. There are no plumbers, there are no steam fitters, no pipe fitters, no electricians, no welders, right? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that, that would be the collapse of Western civilization and the end of uh, our republic. So that'd be very bad. But we're living in a world right now where our thumb is on that scale. And that's why the 10 million open positions that we do have right now fall squarely onto the skilled trades. Mm -hmm. And that's also why the $1.7 trillion that we have in, on the books right now for student debt falls <laughs> very heavily on the university side, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, that's out of whack, just as innovation and imitation are out of whack. It's out of balance. So my foundation awards work ethic scholarships. We we do not offer scholarships for four-year schools, only for trade schools. Mm -hmm. um, we're helping as best we can to train the next uh, generation of skilled workers. But I think maybe more importantly now, we had a big week last week. We got our work ethic curriculum into a big public high school mm. in Vegas. Really? Called Western High. That's awesome. This is a big deal. Um, you, you evoked 
the acronym CRT. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget ESG <laughs> or DEI, <laughs> yes, right? Of this is the, the unholy three, yeah. triumvirate yes, yeah. of angry acronyms, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, our work at the curriculum is not exactly an antidote to that, but it maybe kind of is. Mm. It's a chance for teachers to help lead a conversation in the classrooms about these old virtues that have become almost vices today. Work ethic, personal responsibility, delayed gratification, uh, decent attitude, all things that can really help any young man or woman in whatever their pursuit is. So we've got the curriculum in a freshman class with 750 kids, and we also have partnered with a local foundation in Vegas called uh, the Ingolstadt Foundation. And this woman, Chris Ingolstadt, has become a friend, and she shook $5 million loose to say, let's take the top 50 or 100 people to go through your curriculum and give them a full ride to any trade school in the country. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. That because That's now, huge. now I can start finally to try. I've been doing this 16 years, and most of my stories are anecdotal, and the resources we have, we're modest by foundation standards. We've given away about nine million bucks, have a million right now at Microworks, giving it away this month. Uh, but Chris's foundation is big. And if I can attract the attention of other foundations in other states with similar charters who give a damn about work ethic, then we can get a curriculum in high schools that offers another conversation, mm. another acronym, perhaps. Yeah. yeah, one that maybe defeats the other three. Maybe, or at least gives them at least pushes back a little bit. Yeah, a little choice. Yeah, because work ethic, I mean, how, how in the world, I, I get why it's not in favor. Work is hard, it's, yeah. you know, don't, right? But, but to make it the enemy and, and, and to identify it as a, as a uh, what do they call that? A dog whistle, mm. like a triggering yeah. word, part of the, what, the patriarchy or something. Like, what yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> right. what do you, how did work ethic become? Anyway, that's mm -hmm. my soapbox. Yeah. And that's and we're, what we're pushing. Do you get involved? Microworks? Microworks.org mm -hmm. to apply for a work ethic scholarship. Or if you got some money burning a hole in your metaphorical pocket, we do take donations. Awesome. Uh, can you hang out for another minute or so? Where else would I go? I don't know. I have no idea. Back on Glenn's show? Yeah, no, you don't, want, you don't want I'm that done, to I'm, happen. I've had enough of you. I know. <laughs> Mike Rowe, executive producer and host of Dirty Jobs. Um, guest. It's a guest. Sorry. Guest on Dirty Jobs, the show that he was on every single episode. <laughs> uh, uh, he has, of course, the foundation as well. We'll get back to that here in just a second. We'll take a quick break. Uh, let's look back at the archives from 2013, my old show, The Wonderful World of Stew, Micro, a guest, and there we are <laughs> driving around in one of Glenn's old pickup trucks at the time. Uh, now, you've done probably 8,000 interviews since this one, but I don't think you probably haven't gone through the Chick-fil-A drive through in many of them. I'll never forget that day, Stu. <laughs> look at that. There you are. You're so young and hopeful. Whole life ahead of you. And, th and there I am wearing one of Glenn's shirts. He gave me that shirt that day from the 1791. Yeah. yeah, and you popped it right on. I put it right on. And you said in the radio today, you still have it. I still have it. Yeah. Well, it's it's like made out of canvas. Yeah. I can't get... It, it's a well-made shirt. It's indestructible. Yeah, I have a bunch of their stuff still as well. Um, all right, so we got about two minutes left uh, right. before before we go. Uh, State of the Union speech was last week. Mm. Um, it was an interesting one. We don't even need to comment it, but I love to get Mike Rowe's State of the Union. How do we? Where are we as a country? Are we okay? Oh, now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but I, I, it seemed to me that it seems to me. And this is not a new idea, but I, I don't think we know where to put our faith at the moment. And I, I don't mean that in a, in a biblical way necessarily. I just mean mm. the institutions are upside down. And I think people have every right to feel skeptical about all of the certainty on the airwaves. I, I, I don't need elected officials yelling at me or sounding needlessly certain. I'm just not persuaded by it, right? Uh, I'm not persuaded by journalists looking into that lens and <laughs> telling me to trust them. I just, I'm not, nothing feels persuasive. Even our, even our doctors can't seem to agree, 
you know, right? And so I think people are feeling a little uneasy because they don't know where to put their faith. And I think they're feeling a little uneasy because $34 trillion is an awful lot of money to owe somebody. And we don't understand it. We just know it's awful big and it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, look, in a general way, I think, you know, I was talking to Glenn this morning about this, but it's like, if our country is a restaurant, <laughs> we've walked into it and there are only two things on the menu. Right. And half of us are allergic to one or the other. Yeah. You know, I mean, like really allergic. So my sense is that people want something else on the menu. And they, I feel like what's missing from all of it is just a measure of humility and humor. Mm. We're, we just miss it. I don't know if it's Will Rogers or, I don't know who it is, but we're, Ronald Reagan, maybe. Mm -hmm. We're just, what was that campaign? Morning in America. Yeah, we need a little bit of that. That's what we want. Mm. Mike Rowe, executive producer and host of Dirty Jobs. Guest. He, guest of Dirty, Dirty Jobs. He's the CEO, I think you're still a CEO of the yeah, Mike oh, Rowe Works yeah. Foundation. Absolutely. Also a guest there, I, I, probably, and a guest on his own pos podcast, The Way <laughs> I Heard It with Mike Rowe. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Mike, so great uh, seeing you, and thanks so much for doing this. Million bucks, microworks.org. Go get some. Go get it. Thank you. When you have to buy a home, it sucks, basically. Everything, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you have to rely on other people to tell you what all the documents mean. It's kind of a scary place to be, honestly, especially when you're talking about your biggest financial transaction. We've been talking about entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs in this country. And, of course, Mike's done so much uh, for them and uh, with them over the years. Glenn is a bit of an entrepreneur. You may know this. Uh, yes, The Blaze, you've probably heard of that one. But realestateagentsitrust.com is another company he started years ago basically because he was annoyed at his experiences with real estate agents. And you can sit there and be a victim, and you can complain about it constantly if you wish, or you can do something about it. Glenn did something about it. He started realestateagentsitrust.com. That's now there for you. It's a free service for you. The name kind of says it all. When you need a real estate agent, no matter where you are in the country, go to realestateagentsitrust.com. Check it out now, realestateagentsitrust.com. Joe Biden is an elderly man with a poor memory among other things. We, of course, know that came from the report. And we have now the transcripts that led to that summary. And uh, let me give you some of them. Uh, Joe Biden, quote, well, um, I, 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 I don't know. This is what, 2017, 2018 in that area? Well, remember, in that time frame, my son either has been deployed or is dying. And so it was, and by the way, there were still a lot of people at the time when I got out of the Senate that were encouraging me, encouraging me to run this period, except the president. He didn't want him to run. Um, now, they later clarified, not 2017, 2018. It was 2015. He's told that it was 2015. And then he doesn't really understand that. He also says uh, that uh, Trump got elected in no November of 2017, question mark. Now, you may know this, that every four years we have elections. They're all even years, so it's pretty easy to figure that one out. He also didn't know if he was vice president in 2013 or in 2009. He asked if he was still vice president in 2009, the very first year he became vice president. Uh, these transcripts are as bad as advertised. We'll get into them more on tomorrow's program. You may have heard we have an election this year, and you might not need some coverage of that election that doesn't completely suck. Uh, get some on Blaze TV, blazetv.com slash stew. The promo code is stew. You will save 20 bucks there. Don't forget YouTube. We got the Corinne Jean-Pierre investigation up there now. Check that out, youtube.com slash stew does America. See you later.